Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of the Surge Podcast. So, um, we've talked about ventilators. We've talked about hemodynamics. Um, I'm almost all COVIDed out at this point. Um, I'm not sure if that's a term, but you know, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> uh, I think everybody feels that way. Uh, we're pretty much saturated with the situation, whether you're a um, frontliner slash first responder, or if you are on managerial or advisory board, or you're in the leadership aspect of things, or the policy aspect of things, I think that in general, uh, people are starting to feel a little bit of fatigue. And, um, you know, are basically getting sick and tired of it. Um, to an extent, but I think that it's it's very important to recognize that although you know globally everybody, whether you're a medical professional or not, are frustrated by the social isolation situations uh, or geographic isolations, I, I should say. Uh, whether you're frustrated by um, your current medical situation, whether you're frustrated by uh, your economic situation, is one thing. You know that that's normal to happen, but I think. Yeah, what what I was trying to allude to is, I think that one of the biggest things that we haven't been very well prepared for, even in our medical training, is mental health during situations like this. Now, granted, part of it is that it's completely unpredictable, but the other part is probably the fact that in such situations, it's extremely, extremely, extremely difficult to prioritize things in a manner that makes mental health a focus. And, you know, I, I've been deployed with various non, non-for-profits and non-government organizations uh, to help out, and you do get some training for it. And, and I think that that's something that maybe we should probably talk about for maybe one or two potentially three lectures, 2.5 lectures or, or episodes. And if you have any questions, obviously I'll be more than happy to answer them. And, um, you know, maybe just have a brief introduction so that you're conscious of, of, of how it works and what the dynamics are at least. Again, I, I think it's, I'm a white belt at this stuff as a disclaimer. Um, I know how to screen for PTSD uh, with some patients and that's it. Like I'm not, extremely good at this um but i do try my best to learn and i do rely on experts and colleagues um some of which have have been providing certain services for our frontliners here um and i'll talk about that in a second too but in general you know these are this i think mental support and psychosocial support is one of the number one things that you can do to help a frontliner out and this is based on personal experience, uh, and in addition to that, based on what I'm seeing around me. You know, I see a lot of extremely good, extremely talented, super talented doctors that are outside fields that can work on the front lines, that want to help in any way that they can. I see extremely talented nurses that are outside that scope of expertise, but but want to help in any way they can. And I think that this is your time to shine, whether you, you have a background in mental illness and mental illness support systems or, or, or mental health support systems more aptly, or you don't. Um, everybody has a role to play. And I think that this is one of those roles that people will not give you credit for and, and may not even have somebody assigned for necessarily within the hospital system in certain cultures. It may even be frowned upon, but it's something that I can guarantee you by the end of this talk, you'll sort of understand is something that needs to be addressed. So um, if you think about it, as, a, as somebody who's not on the front lines, you're, you're isolated now. You're isolated from your profession. So let's, let's take a hypothetical of a, uh, I don't know, a dermatologist or a, a highly experienced uh, spinal surgeon or a... Um, uh, you know, a uh, CPMP, a clinical nurse practitioner uh, that regularly does wound care, right? And now has to restrict uh, his or her practice. 
you're already socially isolated and you're outside your comfort zone and, and you're, you're having a bit of a fear that you might get called in to do a, a frontliner's job potentially that you're not particularly comfortable with. You know, lectures go a long way, workshops go a long way, everybody's doing a webinar including sages, etc. But if you're not comfortable, you're not comfortable. And if you've never had ICU and acute care as part of your training and you haven't covered at least 10 emergency shifts a year, you're not going to be comfortable. And this goes for everybody. This goes for even, you know, experts in ICU. If you haven't covered an acute care setting regularly, you're not prepared for this because it hasn't happened to you before. But one piece of advice that I can give you if you're not on the front line and you want to help is to support your colleagues and then to support your community. So support other people who, who are somewhat isolated and get prepared for when you get called. Figure out what you have difficulties with and voice those concerns to your colleagues. Make sure that they know what you can and can't do and how you can help out. That way you'll feel better about it because you've already said, listen, I, I can't handle the ventilator, but I can totally be okay with dealing with the stable patients on the ward after they're extubated. I can provide them with counseling or I can provide them with uh, bed sore and wound care or I can provide them with physiotherapy if you just teach me what to do, or I can provide them with a sort of general ward nurse routine care or tracheostomy care, whatever your specialty is, right? If you're an ENT resident and you're an ENT R1 and you're just barely in your residency, right? Like you've literally just started, man. This is your like first X number of weeks and it's a foreign place and you haven't been there before, but you damn well know that you know ENT. You know, just offer it up and say, listen, I, I really can't handle the ventilators. I'll be willing to help out if you want me to. I have ACLS because I have to get certified in it, but it's really not my thing. You know where I, I think I, I, I'd, I'd be good? I'd be good at checking on your tracheostomized patients. If you volunteer it, they'll take you up on that offer. That's one thing, right? Even if you're not a frontliner. And lastly, you know... <laughs> This is going to be a bit of a long haul. Uh, my personal prediction is it could be August that we see, uh, you know, a, 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 a beginning of a normalcy situation. It could be longer. We, we may, I, we, I don't want to say anything, but it could be 2021 before everything goes back to normal uh, or, or something close to normal. And, and I, I would advise you to take this time to not to just survive it, but to thrive upon it. Do the things that you wanted to do all along but couldn't do. There's a whole bunch of online courses that you can take. If you're a first-year resident and there's absolutely no way that you can contribute because you just got matched and you still haven't started your residency or whatever, and you're just, it's this is not you, take the time to learn a skill that you're going to use later on. So take the time to take an online course on data analytics in healthcare, medical informatics, right? Something like that. You know, build a more robust version of yourself based on what you think you are good at. Not everybody is going to be a phenomenal acute care guy. And not everybody even cares about acute care. There are certain people who will be on the front lines who just aren't comfortable. And that's fine. But there are certain people who clearly will not be on the front lines. And you should not take this time to survive it, but you should thrive in it. And that's all I'm going to say about that. The rest of this talk is going to be on how we can support frontliners and what frontliners can do to support themselves, actually, okay? Uh, you know, how to take care of yourself as one. And it's loosely based on multiple guidelines. Uh, I think that the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent produces an excellent psychosocial booklet on first aid for mental health, and it's phenomenal. Uh, some of the CDC guidances are also good. And the Minnesota Department of Health regularly produces disaster response stuff. Like, it's, it's freaky, the stuff that they come out with. And it's a fairly good summary. Um, I would recommend that you guys read some of these websites and some of the resources there, including the PDF files. And especially the, the first aid, I think, is good for first responders because it'll help you out with your patients, like I'll talk about next episode. So first, I'm going to try and outline some of the things that I've noticed from other settings where I've been deployed as a, as a first responder or frontliner. Because first responders and frontliners, when it comes to COVID as a, as a pathology that you're managing, are, are almost the same thing. 
Because the burden and the load is the same, give or take. So when you look at first responders, whenever they're arriving at a mass disaster event, they always tell you that they have a sort of scale of responses from their patients that vary between cynicism and annoyance, I, or, or even talking to me, just leave me alone, all the way up to an extreme panic situation. Uh, from what I'm seeing, it, it seems to be the same with COVID-19 patients. You know, you have a whole bunch of patients who just don't understand why there's urgency and they're just chilling there and you know whether they're hypoxemically chilling there or not is a matter of debate but they're just chilling there and you have like the extreme panic fear crazy horse um paranoid to hell uh, situation the think that you know it's it's just this is an ever event that can never happen right it's not you so you're dealing with a spectrum of 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 emotions from your patients that's extremely unique and extremely hard for you to process as a human being. I'm, I'm talking as a human, not as a professional, but as a human being. If, if I had people reacting to me with some cynicism or some annoyance and other people reacting to me with extreme panic and fear all day or, or for the vast majority of my day and I'm having to work extra hours, uh, that's going to take a toll on my tolerance for, for the rest of my day, right? And then when they get back home, they have family members who are afraid of, of getting something off of them, i.e. COVID-19, and are also afraid of having them around the house, so they will be socially isolated by default. It's not going to be normal, right? And at the same time, you as a first responder because I've been through it, unfortunately, more than once. Not to this extent and not to this scale. I don't think that anybody has. But, you know, I've, I've, I've had my tough days. And sometimes you want to be socially isolated just to process. And you also want to do it to keep people protected. So you're not getting the regular support system that you're used to at home, whether it's a family member or your roommates or whatever, right? And then there's the whole aspect of COVID-19 that we don't really look at which is, um, or we haven't really acknowledged. You usually, especially as a physician, right? You usually are looked upon like you have all the answers. And you've practiced for so long and you've read for so long that in general, if they ask you about asthma, you have all the answers. If they ask you about COPD, you're going to have all the answers. If they ask you about ARDS, you're going to have all the answers. The problem with COVID-19 from, from a physician's perspective, and I'm talking from a first-person perspective here, I have questions. And I have questions that I can't answer yet, right? And I'm being asked them on a daily basis by people I meet randomly, uh, people who are distant relatives or friends, etc., you know, calling me up to see that I'm okay. I may ask these questions. And the level of frustration that I get when I'm asked these questions and I can't give a full answer or the answer that I'm going to give may reflect the reality that they're not ready to process themselves and I feel very responsible for that you know it, it's different right it's it's another level of, of complexity and fortunately or unfortunately there's a lot of data on this from field paramedics firefighters and EMTs because they go through a lot of this as well when they grab a patient they bring him to you there is no prognosis set so there aren't any real answers there their family members have a certain uh, sort of indecisiveness into how how to how to integrate with them and how to how to discuss things with them. Um, they're used to people reacting in an inappropriate way, and when, by used to it, I mean they've reached a point where they're they're willing to tolerate it to an extent while it's on the job. Obviously, it's not that it's the right thing to do. It's that that's the nature of, of, of the patients that they're dealing with when they're on the field at a um, rock concert where somebody's done something crazy, right? And they do need to get away. Uh, I know more than a couple of first responders uh, from all three fields. So field medics, people who do TCCC stuff regularly, firefighters and EMTs. Um, you know, when you work in Kuwait, you get to meet all three regularly. And when you meet them... It, it, it's tough, man. 
and I'm starting to see it also in acute care specialties. They need that time off. Like they need that time with distance. And remember, for us globally, around the world, nobody's ever seen this before within our lifetime. Nobody's lived long enough to have seen this before. So there is that aspect too, that, that there are so many things that we don't know about it. That, 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 that adds like a whole blanket to this list, right? And that's what it's like being a first responder. And I would argue that that's what it's like being a frontliner. And I'm going to use the terms interchangeably because in my eyes, it's the same thing, right? When you talk about support systems, one of the things that, that I learned, I wouldn't say the hard way, but that, that took me a while to learn was that you can't have a, a one-size-fits-all support system. So you can't have that one person that's going to be able to uh, support your professional concerns and your professional stressors, your social stressors, and your physiological stressors. That person's not going to exist, right? Um, you're you're going to need to do some of the work on your own, and you're going to need to do some of the work with other people. So I'm going to address these uh, each on its own, and I'm not going to have that many details on the slides because it's not an evidence-based issue. The things that are evidence-based are on the slide. The extra stuff is just my personal opinion and anecdotal evidence. So professionally, I like to have debriefs that matter. So when it's a new team, at the beginning and end of every shift, I have a uh, debrief session where we talk about uh, all of the things that matters to the patient, obviously. So things like a, your typical SBAR type of situation or whatever other acronym you use uh, in terms of uh, tools to sign out. But I also do a debrief sequence where I talk about what they didn't like about the shift, what they liked about the shift, and what conflicts happened during the shift. And we do it together as a group, and I try to do it with the nurses as well, uh, especially when, it, when it's on a trauma service, because uh, I think that it's important that we understand that we're all together. And, and I try and do this a lot in the first couple of weeks. I try to integrate everybody in the first couple of weeks. Because I'm trying to get people to talk to each other and build a peer-to-peer -peer support system. So that people who are at the same level understand that for their professional concerns, so for things that there's no way that a layman would understand about the work that we do on a daily basis, especially with COVID patients, these frustrations should be kept amongst professionals who have shared the experience with you. Right? It's that type of support system. And it's because it's a mutual benefit discussion. It keeps patient confidentiality, especially with the stigma attached to COVID-19, which we'll talk about in a sec. And it really does help to support your team dynamic as well. There's good data on that. Okay, So that's what I tend to do. So we'll have a brief on every patient. And SBAR uh, is what we're using these days. And then afterwards, we have a uh, shift brief where we talk about the things that may have stressed us out a little bit and things that, that you know, we don't want to take home with us. And, you know, I, I do that as well at the end of my week on trauma. Uh, support systems, a peer-to-peer -peer level, have a lot of data uh, associated with them. So socially, learn to build a circle of trust. So we all have that, those one or two people. It could be a spiritual person. Uh, like a priest, etc. It could be a uh, non-spiritual person. It could be a person that maybe is a professional, right? So, you know, if you have a counselor, a psychiatrist or something, or it could be a mentor. And I found those particularly helpful. You know, more senior members that aren't necessarily involved in the current practice are probably a little bit older, a little bit wiser. Usually, uh, if they're working in the same field as you are in healthcare, they understand the confidentiality bit and they, they will try their best, their very best, in fact, to support you because they've been through it. And, and they will support you socially as well because in many ways they will convey which aspects. I don't think that, that they, 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 they'll necessarily help you with, with the medical aspects of your stress. But they will help you with the social aspects of your stress because they'll be able to convey 
how how to navigate the social aspects, I would say. The physiological is all on you. So my week on trauma is clearly regimented. I wake up at the same time every day. I eat uh, whatever uh, I need to eat in the morning. And it's regularly. So I'll have a regular breakfast. For the rest of the day, I know that my day is going to be unpredictable. So I will eat when I can, but it will only be one meal that I'll eat when I can. I will try and have a nap whenever I can, because I'm on call for the whole week. And I'll make sure that I have a dedicated hour for exercise. And I've picked up either a video game or a movie that I know I'm going to watch that week. I prefer video games because I can stop them whenever I want, and I still feel a sense of achievement. Uh, The Nintendo Switch has been a godsend last year. Best thing ever. I think that they're sold out right now, but, you know, mine is still working, so it's great. The battery's a bit off, but it's great. And I find that those things, just having some regular foundations. So waking up, even if you've slept at 2 a.m., waking up at 6 in the morning, making sure that you get your one hour of exercise a day, 20 minutes of exercise a day. It doesn't even have to be like real exercise. It can be just walking around. It can be just, um, you know, table tennis. But it's something that you've done. You have that hour allocated to be a device that pins you to real life or what you would deem real life, right? What you would deem to be a fulfilling type of work and, you know, something that's for you, something that you have some ownership over. And then perhaps have one thing to look forward to during the week, that one movie or that 20 minutes of playing video games or now playing video games on your Switch. Because the rest of the stuff, the rest of your meals and your sleeping hours and all these things will not be predictable. But you need to have one or two things that you know will give you that space and that regularity to be able to plan everything around it. So no matter what happens, at 6.30 in the morning, you're going to be awake. No matter what happens, your breakfast is going to be a good breakfast. And no matter what happens, you have that video game to look forward to, and maybe about an hour to an hour and a half of calisthenics, maybe go to the gym. Personally, I I, I miss going to the gym now that they're closed. Um, I find that it also allows me to socialize a little bit. But have that time in place, right? And keep a diary. Now, when I say keep a diary, anybody who knows me knows I'm not the dear diary type. That's not my type of diary. I mean this. So this is just from the Minnesota Department of Health, and uh, I think it's it's a good start. It's called the SciStart Staff Triage System, and it's from Shabra's paper in, in 2012. And it it's it's two different things. So it's 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 a list of support tools that you can use, and uh, it lists the days of the week, and you tick off the days of the week. And that helps you to understand your trauma risk in general, right? So I always ask myself every day, have I seen more than the average number of deaths that I'm used to for that day or lately? Have I ever had to, like, abandon a patient? Have I ever felt that I am unable to meet the patient's needs? Uh, Do I feel responsible uh, for triage or healthcare response recommendations? Am I responsible for talking to an angry, grieving family with um, some sort of dynamic issue, right? Or some sort of mental health issue or some sort of stress-related issue? Am I required to do work outside of my regular working hours? Do I work longer hours than what would be deemed normal for that department? Have I witnessed the illness or death of a coworker? Am I unable to return home? Do I really feel that I can't get home? And even covering trauma outside of COVID, there are days when you feel like that, right? Am I worried about everybody else's health and safety? Am I getting a little bit, I don't want to say paranoid, but am I getting concerned over the fact that they might have a problem? They might be in a car accident. Anybody can come in and stab you. And am I unable to communicate effectively? Do I really feel that there's something that I want to say that I can't say? Am I worried about my own health and safety? And... uh, do I feel personally directly impacted by COVID-19 as an individual, right? And there are, you know, I take these things off and I look at it at the end of my week and that's how I try and figure out whether or not to expect that, that, you know, I might be at risk 
you know, and I've been using it for for a while now, even before they came up with it, uh, this March as part of their their um, COVID nineteen package. I've actually been using it uh, for for our trauma team, but I ask it in a different way, and I sort of I try to make it nonchalant, and it does work, right? Then there's how to manage these issues on a regular basis. So they recommend that you recognize uh, early warning signs of stress, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Reduce physical tension by walking, deep breathing, uh, things like that. Uh, take brief uh, breaks for bodily care and refreshment. Maintain that healthy diet. You know, have a consistent diet. And, you know, avoid or limit caffeine use or alcohol. Caffeine is going to be very difficult, I agree with you, but certainly alcohol we should try and avoid as much as we can. And realize that it's 100% okay for you to just say no. Like, it's not the end of the world for you to just say, listen, I need to take that break. Realize that there's always that time when you can say, can you swap shifts? And we'll talk about buddy system later. And talk with your coworkers. Build that peer support system like we talked about. And always ask for help if you need it. Don't make it into a problem. Get to it before it becomes a problem. Because stress can be healthy. It can be a very good motivator. Anybody who's worked with me in trauma knows that I'm a very big fan of inducing the right amount of stress to get you motivated. Like if you are a uh, R1 family medicine who's rotating on trauma as part of your elective and you really just want to get that chest tube in and for most of your life you've been told that you can observe first for me to get you to put that chest tube in, the stress that you're going to be under is going to be so high that I already have to inoculate you beforehand. That's fine. But that's not what we're dealing with here. All right? With COVID-19 and the situation that we're in, it's a different type of stress. I would call it a, a toxic stress or a malignant stress, right? And the reactions that you get from it may not be very healthy. Now, these are just the unhealthy reactions. So when you're overstressed, physically... You're going to be tachycardic the whole time. You're going to notice that you're getting more and more headaches. You'll be in the toilet a little bit more than you should. And you won't be able to relax when you're off duty. That's the initial sign. So people will say that you're literally up and running the whole time. And you're like a machine. And you will be commended for that by your colleagues because this is an early warning sign. You'll also be a little bit more hostile. Uh, you'll be very quick to place blame on individuals as opposed to systems. You won't ask the right questions at the right time. You won't ask who missed the prescription. You will point at the guy and say, why on earth is this prescription not written? You will not actually sit down and try and define the problem as well as you should because you're running at a mile a minute right now, right? You'll also have a very low threshold to um, address conflicts in a direct manner. Let's leave it at that. And you will be withdrawn socially, whether you like it or not. People won't want to hang around with you. They'll try and avoid you. Your emotional reactions will be will not be sadness. I'm going to make this clear. You will be angry. You will induce fear. And you will induce terror. And uh, you will be argumentative and it will not be nice. And it will lead to a lack of productivity in your team. Uh, I'm painting this dark picture because I've seen it happen more than once. Okay. Yes, there are some people who can use these things as tools. Uh, use uh, controlled aggression as a tool for training, etc. Stress inoculation, all of these things, right? And there's a lot of literature on it. There's a very good book called On Combat. I think that people who work on the front lines should read it after the fact, not during, because it's a little bit disturbing. Then there's a cognitive reaction. So eventually, as things get worse, you're going to get more disoriented and confused. You're going to start to mix up patients. Uh, your decision-making process will be a little bit more confused. You'll know that there's something wrong here, right? You're not making as decisions as slickly as you should. And then there's a behavioral reaction. So you're going to start to take risks, okay? And you're you're not going to wear the PPE when you're supposed to be wearing it. And, and you know, we're seeing that in Italy every now and then these days. Uh, you, you, will, you will put yourself and others into... into a problem and you know that's one of the reasons why i, I would commend uh, anybody who, who can recognize it early because when you've recognized it early you've beaten that endpoint where you could put somebody else at risk and i think that one of the things that makes you not recognize it early is probably alcohol uh, and prescription drugs for sleep etc and the reason why is because 
these things will restore some of your physiology. They will actually make your physiology okay. But that will just mean that the behavior will go unchecked. The cognition will go unchecked. And those will lead to emotional and interpersonal reactions that go unchecked. Right? If you're taking uh, medication to sleep, uh, if you're taking uh, cannabis or alcohol to take, quote unquote, take the edge off, you know, that edge is pretty sharp and it may take more than it should to blunt it. And even when it's blunted, the physical reactions are the things that you lose. The physiology becomes less of a, a litmus test or less of a compass for how things are going, right? And, you know, the management for this is not a single person management. It's not about you alone. It is about you to an extent. We'll get to that in a second. But as a community of professionals, we should try and limit our working hours and set up shifts to help each other. We should never allow somebody to work alone. You should not fly solo. And the reason why you shouldn't fly solo is because this is already a difficult situation. It could be potentially disastrous for you to um, be working alone, uh, end up with no support, and end up... Um, a, getting exposed to COVID-19 and dropping everything in front of you and losing the ability to manage your patients. And B, developing a stress reaction that nobody can control or help to support you through. Okay? So nobody should be allowed to work alone. All right? Uh, assess your team and your personal response in inevitable problematic situations, i.e. conflicts. And diffuse them as necessary if you're good at that. Now, I'm not good at that. I don't diffuse situations. I address concerns. All right. I know that that's my personality. Uh, I'm working on it. I'm getting better at it every day, but it's not my strongest suit. All right. It's not. It's not a Saudalze thing. I'm. I'm just not good at it. I'm good at walking up to the committee members, stakeholders, and saying, listen, I have a real concern here. One ultrasound machine may not be enough for this situation. I think that we should get a second ultrasound machine. That second ultrasound machine should have echocardiographic capabilities. And the reason why is X, Y, and Z. Listen, I really do think that we should be getting a, a dedicated uh, sort of portable ultrasound machine for this service because this service provides a phenomenal bedside service. And that service only requires limited things for line access. And I think that it's an indispensable service and we should leverage it as much as we can. Uh, you know, I, I'm that type of person. Sometimes I may not say it as nicely as that too. In this particular situation, if you're that type of person, if you're like me, my advice would be to find somebody who's very good at diffusing situations and very good at prioritizing what you should fight for and have them tell you what to do. So defer to that person. Sometimes it could be your junior resident. <laughs> Sometimes you'll have a very good junior resident who's volunteering uh, without naming names. Um, and they'll be, listen, bro. Um, yeah. You really need to work on the cortices that we need and the MAC lines that we need. But you really don't need to advocate for the thawed plasma being available in the ambulance right now. That's something that you can advocate for later if you want. And I'm just giving you a hypothetical here. But please do not lose it yet because we really need them to okay those MAC lines. When somebody's that intuitive and they understand your concerns and they understand the type of person that you are, you want to use that person as part of your support team. And you want to have them with you. And everybody on your team should have at least a short break every four hours where they can resume normalcy. So what do I mean by resume normalcy? Stretch out, walk around, um, check their email, check their social media, not COVID stuff, but their social media in general, watch cat videos, do whatever they want. But every four or five hours, if time permits, you should get like a good half hour, maybe, maybe it's only 20 minutes, maybe it's only five minutes, right? Sometimes I only take the five minutes, but every four hours, I'll take some time just to do something outside of what I feel is the norm. And when you're setting up your groups, put people together who will balance each other out, not necessarily best friends. Best friends have a problem, and that is that they know each other so well that they will uh, have the devices, the psychological devices and behavioral devices, to be able to meet endpoints that you may not feel are a priority. 
But having people who can complement each other well, being set up as part of a group, makes much more sense. Now, as a first responder, your first person view, recognize when the stress is making you unhealthy. That diary works, man. I'm going to say it again and again and again. Take a break every four hours. Even if they won't give you that break, just take the break, check your email, call a friend. So what I've been doing lately is I'm just calling friends that I know from high school and saying hi for 15 minutes. And, you know, that's that's helped me a lot in terms of me feeling normal, in terms of them feeling a little bit normal, and in terms of doing something that, that you know, avoids fixation, let's say. Uh, dedicate some time to exercise and creature comforts. Uh, and remember that empathy is important at work. Sympathy is important at work. It's not important at home. At home, you'll just make your family more stressed if you talk to them about what we're doing at work when you're dealing with COVID patients. And uh, share your experience with people that you work with instead. If you need to share a medical situation, you should share it with your colleagues at work or other support systems that you may have online. Whenever you have a disaster or something that goes critically wrong, relax, take a deep breath. These things will happen. It's happening around the world. COVID-19 has been a disaster for everybody. It's been a huge problem for everybody. It's been a huge problem for my local jujitsu gym, which is a place that I go to every single day for three hours a day, right? For close to two years while I've been here, excluding the time that I spent in Montreal going to this place. It's been a problem for restaurant owners. It's been a problem for UFC fighters. It's been a problem for everybody. Everybody who's tried to come themselves in a, a nonchalant a business as usual manner with COVID-19 has not done well. The people who have done relatively well are people who learn and recognize that these things will happen. The situation has to be diffused because it's a high stress situ environment no matter what you do. And you need to address the concern and not address the stress behind the concern at the time. Okay. It's very important. I think it's ridiculously important to say that, that your usual high standards for um, you know operating room efficiency, for uh, ER flow rates should not be a source of stress for you. There should be something that you keep an eye on, but there shouldn't be something that could stress you out or stress your team members out. It doesn't mean that you're going to accept mediocrity. It means that you're going to accept a less than optimal outcome in a particular situation to lead to an overall better outcome globally. And use that diary. Recognize the warning signs early. In addition to that, two things that I would recommend are get a buddy system started. So I have a buddy who uh, nobody really knows, who is extremely well-versed in medical shit, uh, can do the stuff probably better than I can. And we've both agreed that uh, we're going to talk to each other regularly, uh, every day, uh, while the situation is going on, whether we're on the front line, whether we're eating pizza, whatever it is, just to make sure that we control our stress levels and we can keep an eye on each other because uh, we've both seen what can happen uh, when you're not. Uh, we share the same technical backgrounds, uh, we share the same, um, relatively the same training knowledge base. And, you know, it, we've both had this become a priority for us. And I think that's important to have that buddy system and to have an agreement beforehand that when things get out of hand, there's not going to be a discussion. You're going to listen to your buddy, and your buddy's going to take over for you, right? And recognize when you need help. By help, I mean professional help, okay? So you need help before you get to this point. So, because we're not going to, we're a very limited number of people. People who do acute care, ICU, anesthesia, surgery, trauma surgery, traumatology, uh, resuscitation, emergency medicine, uh, all of us are under the same roof right now. It's like a, I keep saying again and again, I don't care what label you carry, your job description is probably the same. 
and your character and skill set are probably the same. And the conflicts that we have are conflicts that are designed for resource allocation and for uh, administrative discussions. They're not conflicts that are designed around the discipline itself or around our training, right? I've always said that and I maintain that. But right now we are scarce. Our expertise is extremely rare and extremely scarce and is in extreme high demand to the extent that if one of us falls because of COVID-19 or falls because of burnout or falls because of PTSD or secondary stress reactions, then our whole army is weakened. Right? It's like a phalanx. Every single part of a phalanx has to be robust and strong so that when one part fails, the rest of the phalanx can take over. That's our attitude. So we should not find burnout. We should not see burnout. We should keep an eye out for it, and we should maintain the support that we need through our colleagues, etc., like we talked about for this whole talk. So parts of burnout include sadness, depression, empathy, or apathy, uh, easily frustrated, blaming others, irritability, lack of feelings or indifference, isolation, poor self-care and hygiene, a feeling of failure, a feeling like you're completely helpless, like you're not doing your job well, and like we talked about, alcohol and drugs, uh, etc. You want this to not happen, and you want to detect it early while it's happening. Now, signs of secondary traumatic stress, they're a little bit harder to define because I've seen cases where there's a lack of insight. And that's what scares me sometimes. It's that you yourself don't know. So with burnout, you kind of... I find that a lot of the time I kind of know when I need to take a break. But with uh, secondary stress uh, reactions or secondary traumatic stress or PTSD, you don't know. You're worrying that something bad's going to happen. Uh, you're always on guard and ready to go. You have some physical signs of stress. You're awake and you're running around like the Energizer Bunny. And at the same time, you, you, you're not sympathizing or empathizing anymore you're at this point feeling that every single patient with COVID-19 is you getting COVID-19. Every single patient that's stabbed in the chest is you getting stabbed in the chest. And nothing that people are doing is good enough. And when that happens, you know, all bets are off. When you're at that point, you have no insight anymore. And that's where we don't want to get to. If you're a non-first responder and you're seeing these signs, be that buddy. Provide some support. Catch up with the person that you're talking about. Arrange for regular online sessions with them. Get to talking with them. Provide a support system, especially if this is your area of expertise. Believe me when I say this. This is the unaddressed part in every guideline in critical care to do with COVID-19 in every paper. People are not talking about mental health. People are not talking about how to support the system in terms of mental health. And people are not making mental health experts rise to the occasion. They're not giving them the opportunities that they need to provide that health. You know, and when we did in Kuwait, uh, the neuropsychiatry unit at the Amir's hospital set up a telepsychiatry system 24-7 available to you. Like, you don't even have to think. You text the guys and they're ready to go. This is being run by Abdullah al Uzeri, who's one of our psychiatrists here. Uh, I think he trained in Toronto. He's very, very, very keen on this stuff, right? And I think that, you know, if there's if you're an admin person or in a leadership position, if there's one thing that I would say you need to do, and the word need is very important here, it's uh, to provide that for you, your frontliners. Don't force them to do it. Don't say that, listen, you have to talk to this guy or whatever. I haven't called him, you know. I know him personally as a friend. I called him with that respect. I haven't called him because... Of anything that I'm experiencing, but you should, you should ideally, if if you're feeling the need as a leader to, to intervene, and you know you feel that that there are things that aren't going right, yeah, you know, to talk to a mental health expert, get them to volunteer and help out, even if it's from home, which might be very wise, right? And there's a lot of data that telepsychiatry works. I think it's extremely important. So in summary, get that diary going. If you're not a frontliner. This is your time to shine. This is what we need you for. If you're a frontliner, keep an eye out for the stressors. Have some things that underpin your day. Build your professional support system and build your social support system robustly. 
and you know we're all feeling it this week i think and it's crunch time and like i always say when it's time to go you go right you don't dilly dally you don't discuss it you just rip it you know go for it good luck everybody let me know your thoughts and please subscribe